Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started this evening. Father, we ask your Holy Spirit to teach us tonight, enable us to comprehend what you're saying. We can look at the world around us and everything that's happening through your lens, what scripture has to say. So we yield our minds and our understanding to the leadership of your spirit. And we thank you for hearing in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're down to uh, in John chapter 15. Let me read, start with verse 23, and then I'm going to try to tile this together so we can see where there's a break and where there's not a break. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. But they have done this to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Now it would almost seem that verse 26 is taking up something brand new, but in reality it's not. So let me read verses 26 and 27. And then I'll tie that in with the first four verses of chapter 16. When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. And you will testify also because you have been with me from the beginning. Uh, let me stop reading right there and I'll get back to four, uh, first four verses if I, if I can get that far. Jesus has stated very clearly to all of us tonight, when we are genuine disciples, when we are allowing the Holy Spirit to control us and we are producing fruit, the world's going to hate us. We no longer belong to the world. If we did, then the world would not express that hatred toward us. But he wants us to understand tonight, the moment we trusted Jesus, he took us out of Adam and put us into Christ. And now, spiritually, we belong to him. We live in the physical world, but we're not to allow the world to dominate and control us. And I've shared with you, God, John uses this word world five times in one single verse. So it behooves us to understand what that meant. And I tried to share with you two things it means. It means, number one, the whole mass of humanity that's separated away from God. They don't know God. They don't want to know God. And secondly, the world system that's dominated by the God of this world, Satan. And Jesus has put a dividing line between us and the world. And, and so many times we step back over that line. And we allow the world system and everything that is in it to dominate and control our lives. And therefore our choices and our decisions that we make. And he's reminding us again tonight what he tell, told them back in John 13. The slave is not greater than its master. So if they persecuted him, they're going to persecute us. I can expect that if I am walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and that fruit is being produced fruit through me. So I have to look at my own life and my own present walk and is that occurring? And I don't mean that you're going to have suddenly the whole world coming after you, but those within your sphere of influence, maybe family, maybe friends, uh, those that you work with or in school. There is a decided difference, and he is stating that the hatred of the world will be manifested towards you. Now, follow this all the way through. The hatred of the world had always existed from the Garden of Eden. When Jesus came, they had a face with God. Up until that point, they just rejected God. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. So before our Lord Jesus came to the earth, the hatred of the world system didn't have any big opportunity to express that in overt action like it did when Jesus came. 
Now, you're going to have to think this through for a moment because we don't put all this together. It did express evil. They killed the prophets. They distorted God's word. They disobeyed what he had said to them. And Jesus even declared when he came, they had turned his house into a den of thieves and robbers. But now suddenly God was incarnate before them. They had a face. They had a person. And then they began to observe his works. They heard his words. When God had fully and supremely expressed himself in his Son, in the flesh of humanity, the long-promised Messiah that the Jews had been looking for, suddenly the world system was face to face with the very one it hated. Let that settle in your mind for a moment, folks. The world system that hated God was now face to face with the very one they hated, God in human flesh. And now the Lord Jesus became the occasion for the world to expose its hatred and express it toward Christ and toward all of those who trusted him. So the simple fact for all of us tonight, the world hates what doesn't belong to it. Hates us. He's bringing the person of God face to face with them. And sometimes we're insulated, we don't see that. But folks, I, and I know you get tired of hearing me say that. Let me give you three quick examples. We're seeing that, and this is seeing it from a biblical perspective, and I, I just shake my head sometimes. I, God expects us to use godly wisdom. Not just secular reasoning, and I hear that all the time. He expects us to use godly wisdom. And we don't see any kind of overt action necessarily right now toward the church, but it is creeping in in ways that we don't understand because we now have a government. And the reason I'm tying this in because this is, this is so subtle. We, we now have a government that is almost full-blown socialist. And that government is expressing its hatred toward people. It is dividing up. It, right, it's the vaccinated against the unvaccinated. Now, it is the Department of Justice coming against parents who don't like what is being taught in the school with their children. And all of this is totally unconstitutional, folks. But that's why they're in the business of trying to move the Constitution out and shred it so that we don't have that anymore. We are a republic that is under constitutional law. That's just two expressions. And if this lies monstrous bill goes through, it'll unleash hell against the church and Christians. It's written in there and we just don't know it. We don't see it. Wow. And we're watching politicians that can spew out all kinds of stuff who love photo ops. They love to post things. They like to say things. But they're not doing anything against it. Nothing. Nothing. Wow. How is all this happening? Because we're in a world system that's dominated by the evil one. And Christians don't seem to understand that. And Jesus has told us very plainly, the world expressed that hatred toward me. They despised me. They didn't like my words. They rejected my works. They didn't want me. And therefore, you need to understand, because they hated me, they're going to hate you. And maybe you haven't faced that yet. And I shared with you last week that word persecute he uses in verse 20 means to chase after somebody, to harass them. It's, it's like somebody chasing a wild animal to kill that animal. 
what the master experienced, so will the servant. You remember what God asked Saul on the road to Damascus? Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, Saul was persecuting the church, but the church was Jesus. Why are you persecuting me? The world system hates God, folks, and hates those who belong to them. And he explained, as we saw last week, the reason the world system hates Jesus and hates Christians is because they don't know God. One Greek scholar on verse 21 put it very clearly. The disciples were to be not only, in fact, the victims of world hatred, of world's hatred, but the object which the world deliberately sought to overpower. And we're seeing that happen to our lives and our freedoms, and it hadn't been overtly against the church yet, but it's coming. It is coming. And Jesus said, they'll do that to you because they don't know me. They don't know the one who sent me. And the world, it, it just, uh, the world is sophisticated. It's intellectual. It is spiritually ignorant of God. And yet, because we don't recognize it, we don't know how to challenge it or stand and come against it. And when you look at what is occurring and you hear people who know what is going on say, unless there is divine intervention, we don't have any hope. We have no hope. And I look at this from a biblical perspective and I see everything that's going on and those shadows are lengthening. We may be much closer, and I say this all the time, but I tune in to Dr. Jeremiah. We are closer to the rapture now than we were yesterday. And things just keep increasing in intensity. What? And then we act surprised. God sent the Son. And the Son said very clearly to the unbelieving Jews, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you know me, you'll know the Father. And the only way you're going to come to know the Father is through me. But the world rejected that. The world's not honest about its own sin. And this is what Jesus was saying in the verses that I read to you. If I had not done the works among them, they wouldn't have had any sin. They were without excuse. They saw Jesus. They heard Jesus. They saw his miracles. They heard his words. And now they're without excuse. It's just like everybody coming to church on Sunday. You hear the word of God and hear the word of God and you're without excuse. From that point on, you are without excuse. Even for believers, when I hear the word of God, I am now responsible to do what I've heard, to obey what God is saying to me. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit. Satan has blinded their minds. Well, and Jesus said, now they have no excuse. All of this is to fulfill the law. They hated me. They're going to hate your father. God had prophesied that in the Old Testament. And then all of a sudden we're at verse 26. And this seems like a break. We're, we're in some kind of new subject. No, we're not. In John chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples. This is the upper room discourse. He is teaching them. He is preparing them from his, for his coming death and resurrection and ascension back into heaven. And he wants them to understand that even though he's leaving them physically, he will send another of the same kind. And they will not only, that another of the same kind will not only be with them, that one will be in them. And now all of a sudden in verse 26, he is moving to the Holy Spirit and bringing the person of the Holy Spirit to the front of his teaching. And that becomes extremely important to you and me. So let me say this again, folks. 
in, verses 20, in verse 23, there is a divide between God and his followers. A great divide. And now in 24 and 25, Jesus gives the conclusion of his argument. There's a, a, a tremendous gap between holy God and sinful humanity. Now, now notice what they rejected, his works and his words. Here's a gap. You're too young probably to remember Simon and Garfunkel and they had a hit song, Bridge Over Troubled Waters. Who's going to bridge that gap from here to there? And the answer was the works of Jesus. And that's what he said. They rejected my work. The Father sent me to be the sacrifice for man's sin to be his substitute, his sin bearer. And when he cried out, it is finished, the work of redemption was over, done. And when Jesus came out of the grave, God accepted that finished work and validated it and said to the world, this is my beloved son. He did what I sent him to do. Well, he provided the bridge now Jesus is condemning these Jews. They heard him. They saw him. He revealed the Father. And the verdict for them is now guilty. In the Greek, it's a legal dictum. They hated me without a reason. Psalm 35, you can look this up on your own. Psalm 35 and Psalm 69. And Jesus said, even though they hated me without a reason, Scripture was being fulfilled. It stands written, and that's a perfect tense. It was written at a point, and it stands until this day. And he's not just talking about a set of rules. He's talking about the Torah as a whole, the Old Testament. Not merely this set of rules, but now over in the, new, the whole Scripture, Jesus said to them, you don't know your father Abraham. You're not following. If you knew him, you would know who I was. You're not following in your own scriptures. Now, when I understand that, verse 25 closes... This context of chapters 15, 1 through 25. We are branches in the vine. And because we abide in him and he abides in us and we are in the word and we allow the Holy Spirit to control us, we are producing fruit. And I prove that I really do love Jesus by obeying him. That's the genuine mark of a disciple. Not only are we disciples, but he's also declared that we are his friends. And that's why he has said, if you walk in my will and you're producing fruit, it will bring persecution. It'll bring hatred and hostility from a world system that does not know me. Now, beginning with verse 26, Jesus will take up again what he promised back in chapter 14, the Holy Spirit would come. When he finished his work on earth, he's going to go back to the Father in heaven, but he would not leave them alone down here. He will send another of the same kind. And beginning with verse 26 of chapter 15 all the way through 1615, Jesus returns to his teaching that he started in John 14 about the ministry and the role of the Holy Spirit. Now notice that this section starts in chapter 15, verse 26, not chapter 16. One thing I try to get across to the students in preaching class, you have got to find everything in context. And what you have in your Bible, whatever translation you're reading out of, the divisions there are put there by the translators. They're not in the original language. So sometimes... 
you'll have a chapter stop and then another chapter start, and you shouldn't do that. You need to look at, at a whole in context. One of the most uh, knowledgeable Old Testament Greek scholars the world's ever known was Dr. Bruce Metzger. He died in, in 2007. Uh, he was an unbelievable New Testament Greek scholar. And Dr. Metzger said it like this. Let me just quote this. He delighted to tell his students that the chapter and verse divisions as they appear in our Bibles today are often about as logical as someone putting a mark in their text every time a rider on a horse trotted or galloped. You just put it in there. And that's not where it is in the Greek. I don't know if that makes any sense. The role of the Holy Spirit in your life and my life begins back up here, actually back in chapter 14, and he's taking it back up starting in verse 26 of chapter 15. His ministry, and this becomes significant, his ministry to the believer in the midst of persecution and hostility. 1536, William Tyndale was burned at the stake, choked on this date. You know why? Because he translated the Bible into English. And he died for that. 1536. So when we face this hostility... If you're not a believer, you don't have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. But if you are a Christian, that's why we're commanded to be controlled by him, to walk in him moment by moment by moment. And Jesus returns to this teaching so we will understand what he is saying. You are to abide in the vine. You are to obey the word. And you are to understand that you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And so in verse 26, this is what he says, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. This little word when in the Greek is a particle of time And when it is followed by a tense that this verb is in, it assumes this is going to happen. It will occur. And so, as our Lord is promising them that the Holy Spirit would come, he came on the day of Pentecost, just like God promised. He came on time. He came on schedule. God didn't look down at the world and say, wait a minute, the world is out of control, it is full of chaos and disorder, I've got to do something. No, you go back to Leviticus 23, the seven feast of Israel, he promised the Holy Spirit was coming on what the Jews know, at the, at what we know today is the day of Pentecost. Promise that. Jesus was saying it over and over and over again. And in Acts chapter 2, on that particular day, the Holy Spirit came. This is what Jesus is promising in verse 26. When the helper comes, the parakletos, the one called alongside, and he'll not only be alongside of you, he will be in you. I will send him to you from the Father. And then he defines that Holy Spirit. He's the spirit of truth. Wow. Wow. You want to know what's happening in this world today, folks? I quit. I, t- I say this. I don't listen to the news media anymore. They lie through their teeth. They have an agenda. They have a priority. They're trying to twist your thinking into telling you this is how terrible it is. A- and I was reading a post today about uh, Pfizer, and they're trying to keep quiet about a lot of this stuff because they do not want this to end. They're making big bucks, and the politicians support that, do not want their hands off of the control. It it amazes me people can't see through that. 
We're almost two years into this thing. Ooh. Uh -huh. The Spirit of Truth. The Holy Spirit will guide you in Scripture. He'll enable you to see it. And I've been researching this for a number of weeks, and I, I have amassed a pile of stuff. I didn't even bother, didn't even bother reading that it to you. I just, uh, we just don't think. We don't perceive. We don't understand. He's the spirit of truth. And then he adds this, and I'll stop. When the spirit comes, the spirit of truth, he will testify of me. He will testify of me. Now, folks, do you ever wonder why you don't witness? Or why people who profess to know Jesus don't witness? If you have a genuine relationship to Christ, you're indwelt by him through the Holy Spirit, why do we not witness? He didn't give us a spirit of fear and timidity. Jesus said, when the Spirit comes and lives in you, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. If you're controlled by the Holy Spirit in your daily walk, you can't contain yourself, folks. You just cannot contain yourself. Out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. I, I've shared this story before. I, the Spirit just brought that back. Let me close with this one. I, I was in revival down in, uh, out from Leesville. Uh, out in the middle of nowhere. A young boy that I witnessed to got killed in a, a car wreck that same week and I got back to the church on Friday from up here and people were crying and I thought and a young mother a young a young mother wanted to give a testimony and I thought she was going to give a testimony about this young boy that got killed you know he was uh, 18 years old uh, 20 years old and refused to accept Jesus in the trailer I pleaded and pleaded and pleaded with Teddy and he didn't accept Jesus he wouldn't do it his older brother was sitting in a chair, and he looked at his older brother, and his older brother was shaking his head, no, we're not going to do that. Well, I thought this young lady was going to give a testimony about Teddy getting killed in a car wreck. Instead, she stood up, and she said, many of you know, and she's a young mother, many of you know that I've been going through uh, training to be a witness. And she said, this morning when I got in my van and I started to school, the Lord laid a certain man on my heart, and everybody in this community knows this man. He has known ties with the mafia. They knew that. But God put this man on my heart. I dropped the kids off at school, and I started back to the house, and the Holy Spirit was so strong in my life. The next thing I knew, I looked up, and my van was in the driveway of this man's house. I'm talking about a young, a young mother, wife. He said, I got out of the van and I went to the door. Can you imagine being in that situation? A known mafia man. I went to the door and knocked. And he opened the door. And I went inside and shared with him why I had come. And he prayed and asked Christ to come into his heart. <laughs> wow. That wasn't that young mother. That was the Holy Spirit living on the inside of her. And Jesus said, you need to understand this. You're going to be facing this. He's the spirit of truth and power and sound mind. And he will give you what you need. We're at a point in our culture and in our churches today, folks, when we need to take that stand. Need to take that stand. Let me pray real quick. Michael's going to come and lead us in our prayer request time. Father, honor your word tonight. Bear fruit in our lives because we've heard you speak. In Jesus' name we pray. Family, I've got uh, a little list here, prayer requests. Uh, 
Miss Carol, our sister Sean, is caring for her mother, and uh, Sean is on crutches herself. So that's making it quite difficult. Shannon and Mary, um, her grandmother, is on hospice. I'm cold. That's okay. Said a co worker, um, a co worker's mother, pancreatitis to Baylor for more tests. Y'all bear with us. Some changes to the sound. Okay. So we got to get it tweaked a little bit. Okay. Gotcha. Um, need to be in prayer for Dr. Cliff and uh, Miss Becky. Uh, in praying for a guy by the name of Kenneth that I witnessed to this past Friday night. Um, a lady by the name of Joy that I met today, uh, she's looking for a church home. Um, a co-worker of mine, Mike, has a daughter that's over in Texas on a ventilator with, on co with COVID. Uh, also have um, another co-worker, um, death of a son out in California. Uh, Lisa has it, uh, Pat is having some jaw pain. Uh, Debbie said a member of a friend family uh, has COVID. I praise Jennifer is home. I know she's glad to be back home. Also, Karen uh, said that uh, Jean and Becky Nix, uh, family over at Shreve City Baptist Church, that Brother is on hospice now. Um, Dr. Cliff has a student uh, in our Tuesday night class, Isaac, that had to travel overseas for a death in the family and for the funeral of that family member. Uh, Sandy, that Larry and Judy uh, Stokes are recovering from COVID. We've got several um, members of the church that have friends or family that are recovering from COVID or suffering with COVID. Miss Carol for some continued tests and test results. Miss Becky also wanted me to bring up that we have Bible study for the women coming on the 29th. The men's Bible study is on the 14th. And also we have the church uh, cleaning this Saturday. And I think that's 8 o'clock. 8.30, excuse me. I get to sleep 30 minutes longer. All right. Do we have any prayer requests inside the sanctuary here or online? Here we go. We got to pray for God. Okay. We will do that. Also, on the back, back there, there's a calendar that uh, has been placed back there with uh, dates. We still have a few openings. Uh, praying for Dr. Cliff and Miss Becky. If, um, if you feel led to take one of those dates, and it's not going to hurt if somebody else is on that date. I'm sure Dr. Cliff would appreciate the extra prayers. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the ability to gather into your house tonight and to hear Dr. Cliff uh, bring your word. Father, pray that you open up our hearts and minds, Father, that we can process what we've heard tonight. Father, pray that you would keep our eyes open to all those things that are happening around us. Father, we can see you happening every single day. Father, you've heard the requests that have, have been known and made known here, Father. There's so many others that are unspoken. Father, you even know about those and those that we don't even know about yet. Father, I pray that you continue to be in those situations. Father, I pray that you would be with the Awanas as they meet after this meeting. Father, that you would open up the hearts and minds of those children. And, Father, be with the instructors, the teachers, Father, that will deliver your word to them. Father, I pray you forgive us where we fail you and bring us back safely Sunday in Jesus' name. Amen.